Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 59, The Zhou Dynasty. Amidst the smoldering ruins of the palace at Yin, the Shang Dynasty was no more. In what's becoming a familiar tale, a corrupt dynasty with a depraved and wicked ruler has fallen to the military might of a righteous challenger. This time it was the Zhou, led by Wu, the new king of the realm. He gets right to work moving the capital to Hao, slightly west of modern Xi'an and comfortably within Zhou territory. Sometimes it's best to just rebuild a city, other times it's best to move on. And seeing as how the last time Wu was in Yin, he had speared the corpses of the last king, Di Xin, and his concubines, then proceeded to behead all of them, a change of scenery was probably a good thing. So Wu is now in charge, but it's not like the previous dynasty just rolled over and accepted him. There's plenty of people in groups who'd like to ignore him, or question his authority. Wu immediately sets about assuring his right to rule through religious ceremonies, releasing soldiers from their service, distributing grain and treasure to the populace, and receiving dignitaries from tribes outside of his official territory. In doing these, he's pretty much covering all his bases here. Now one of these tribes, the Lu, become famous as a parable for all future leaders because of what they give as tribute. Dogs. Actually hounds with impeccable loyalty and training. Wu loved his new doggies, but his chief minister, who was probably more of a cat person anyway, was insistent that Wu send back the dogs, arguing, Even dogs and horses that are not native to the king's country, he will not keep. Fine birds and strange animals will not nourish in his state. When he does not look on foreign things as precious, foreigners will come to him. In other words, don't let foreigners, i.e. barbarians, know they've got something you want. This little piece of advice will continue to be passed down, generation after generation, with merchants from distant lands looking at China with hungry eyes, only to be told they possess nothing of interest for the Middle Kingdom. Which is what the Zhou eventually call their land, Zhongguo, the Middle or Central Kingdom. So named because they see themselves as bastions of civilization surrounded by barbarians on all sides. Zhongguo is also the name of modern China, as a way to hearken back to an ancient culture, but to also bring together the numerous ethnic groups of China as one central group of people. But back to Wu. Aside from not getting to keep a pet, Wu continued to put things back to normal during this transitional period. And while many Shang lords were booted to the far reaches of the kingdom, Wu takes a different approach with the son of the previous Shang king, Di Xin. Lu Fu whose destiny as king was halted by the Zhou, was put in charge of rebuilding and maintaining Yin as a base. Of course, Wu also sent two of his own brothers to keep an eye on Lu Fu, just in case the last of the Shang line might be hatching schemes of revenge. Probably better just to not go down that path at all, but it's his decision, and he's the king. His desire to return to the status quo and right all these wrongs might have to do with his spiritual beliefs. Wu was obsessed with receiving heaven's blessing, the Mandate of Heaven. I've mentioned this term before, but this is the first time the Mandate of Heaven appears in written Chinese history. Wu constantly worries if he will be a just and noble leader, and paces late into the night, unable to sleep. He mentions to his younger brother, We must single out the evil people and remove them as I did Di Xin. Day and night we must reward and comfort the people to secure our land. Good things can happen under the leadership of one like him. Unfortunately, Wu comes down with a severe illness, and despite an exorcism to try and cure him, he dies in 1043, just three years into his reign. Succession being what it is, his son Chang would take the throne next, but he's too young, so Wu's brother, Tan, Duke of Zhou, acts as regent. He's remembered in Chinese history as a paragon of statesmanship, so dedicated to his profession that he would oftentimes rush out of a bath, still soaking wet to conduct official business. But first things first, he needs to deal with the final gasp of the Shang. Back in Yin, yeah, you saw that coming a mile away, Wu's two brothers didn't like playing babysitter and began fomenting rebellion, wanting to put Lu Fu back on the throne. This revolt barely got off the ground before the Duke of Zhou easily crushed them, with one brother and Lu Fu dying in battle. This time, there would be no olive branch for the last of the Shang line. Any surviving collaborators with the rebels were exiled to the eastern reaches of the realm. 
The Duke of Zhou also formally establishes feudalism as the way of the land. So far, China's been operating in a way that looks a lot like feudalism, but lords and nobles had way more autonomy than they're supposed to. Now, with the Zhou, the nobles lose that ability to operate independently and must swear allegiance and dependence towards the Zhou king. In return, they were given massive land grants, fiefs, that would become the basis of several later Chinese states. Han, Song, Qi, Jin, Wei, Shu, many of these might sound familiar because they'll form their own dynasties later on, and they all start here. Once Chong is old enough, his uncle steps out of the way for him to become king. His reign is fairly typical, with smashing barbarians and promoting civilization all along the way. He also shows himself to be his father's son through and through, because Chong also obsesses over the mandate of heaven, and doing right by his people. He also passes on certain kernels of wisdom to his successors, including make pliable those distant, and make capable those near. Pacify and encourage the many countries, large and small. And honestly, the next couple of Jode leaders are pretty uneventful. In history, uneventful is boring. In real life, uneventful is good. The fifth Zhou king, Mu, breaks with tradition a little bit, as he's a bit of an expansionist, with a desire to leave the track of his chariot everywhere. He spends so much time fighting outside the kingdom that he has to reorganize the whole bureaucratic system at home just to deal. New titles are created for lords, like supervisor of lands and supervisor of the horse, and fiefs are further redistributed to keep the nobles continually bound to the king. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, when does this dynasty fall into predictability and collapse? And my answer is soon-ish. The first sign of trouble really begins with the 10th king, Li. A greedy man, he was told that the people were upset over his hoarding grain and gold. But instead of hearing them out, he sought out the friendship of an advisor who was also a magician. His greatest power so he claimed, was the ability to uncover anyone harboring treasonous thoughts. You could see how dangerous that could be. As real and imagined detractors disappeared, any overt criticism of Lee's leadership magically also disappeared. Happy that all was well again, Lee bragged about it to a duke of his, the Duke of Shao, but the duke responded, This is merely blocking up criticism. To block people's mouths is worse than blocking a river. When an obstructed river bursts its banks, it hurts a great number of people. For this reason, those who regulate rivers let them flow. Those who regulate people let them talk. Lee could not be bothered to care, and for three years his reign of terror continued until about 841, when an uprising led by either peasants or nobles drove the king into exile. The Duke of Shao stepped in to save the dynasty by hiding the heir to the throne, who was just a toddler at his house. Of course, once this was discovered, the angry mob marched right to his doorstep, demanding the child while he pleaded with them to leave. Ultimately, in order to appease the bloodlust of the crowd, the Duke of Shao replaced the heir with his own son, whose fate is not recorded, although it seems sadly evident what happened to him. As for the Duke of Shao, he and a later Duke of Zhou kept the dynasty going for 14 years until Li's heir was old enough to rule. He would lead the Zhou against further barbarian incursions, but ignored his ministers and ruled the people too hard. He may or may not have been assassinated, depending on what account you read, but the anger towards the Zhou was reaching a breaking point. And not just from the people, but the heavens as well. It came as no surprise then, when in 781 BC, King Yu took the throne, and there was a series of natural disasters. Earthquakes, eclipses, odd signs, all ominous stuff. Yu is a strange leader as they go, but he's not as weirdly cruel as previous kings. No bizarre torture devices or beef jerky gardens here, only a deep infatuation with his concubine, the Lady Su. Cute. But he loved her so much that he made her queen, which meant booting out the current queen and the heir to the throne. What a Romeo. Now the Lady Su, despite her charms, is as humorless as they go. She just doesn't laugh. And Yu tried numerous methods to get her to crack a smile, but no luck. That is, until one night, when the capital city of Hao awoke in total alarm. The emergency beacons were lit. Drums were beaten as loud as they could, as Yu's vassal lords raced to the capital to protect their king from invasion, and instead found the Lady Su howling with laughter at the sight. 
There were no invaders. The whole thing was a prank. Ha ha ha. This might have happened a few more times, too, because aside from loving to see silk fabric get torn apart, this is the only thing she enjoys in life. Whatever. The other problem here is that the previous queen had a powerful temper, along with powerful allies. Her dad was Marquis of a state called Shen, and he was spitting mad at this insult to his daughter. He allied up with another state called Seng, whose leaders claimed descent from the oldest Xia dynasty kings. They even convinced a barbarian tribe to aid them in repaying you for this offense. In 771, Zhou scouts spotted this massive coalition approaching the capital, and King Yu ordered the emergency beacons lit. But Aesop wouldn't be born for another 150 years, and so King Yu had never heard of the boy who cried wolf. No vassal lords came to his rescue. The city of Hao is sacked, Yu is slain, and as for the Lady Su, all that is recorded is that she was carried off by the barbarians as prisoner. Her fate is a mystery. And so another corrupt king falls, having lost the mandate of heaven. Only this time, the death of Yu is not the end of the Zhou dynasty. The victorious armies hold a great meeting with the vassal lords, and all agree to put the original heir to the throne, Ping, back in power. One of Ping's first acts is to move the capital east to the city of Luoyang. The barbarian allies who defeated Yu did a real number on the city of Hao. A little too good of a number. It wouldn't make sense to stick around there any longer. Plus, they kind of know how to get in now. From a security standpoint, it's a good idea to get going. So Ping loaded up his royal baggage train with treasure and relics and supplies and weapons and... Hmm, this might be a little dangerous. I mean, the royal guard could handle any bandit threat, but what if there's a barbarian attack? The last of the Joe could be wiped out before he has a chance to start. Ping takes an unorthodox step towards securing his safety and enlists the aid of a tribe outside Zhou territory called the Qin. The Qin people were famous for their horses and were skilled and feared warriors. A little on the uncivilized side, but Ping figures, hey, fight fire with fire. The Qin soldiers successfully keep Ping safe until he arrived at Luoyang. And in gratitude, he grants their chieftain the title of Duke of Qin, awarding him a large amount of land, including the previous sack capital of Hao. Ping probably figured that since he doesn't need it anymore, what's the harm in giving it away? Which is fine, and the Qin were appreciative and honored and all that normal courteous stuff. But maybe you know about them, and maybe you don't. Regardless, this isn't the last we hear of the Qin. As for us, the Zhou were down, but not out. This period of time is commonly known as the Western Zhou, since their capital was out west. Now that their new capital is to the east, we enter the period of time called the Second Western Zhou. No, it's called the Eastern Zhou. But while the dynasty exists, they've lost authority over Zhongguo. The real power was now in the hands of those nobles who controlled the largest fiefs. States in their own right. All these lords had to do was pay lip service to the Zhou king, and they could be free to carve out a little kingdom for themselves. Why, if they played the game well enough, what's to stop a powerful state from claiming the mandate of heaven and making a bid for the throne itself? So next time, we move on to the Eastern Zhou, or the Spring and Autumn Period, on the podcast history of our world. <laughs>